Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Great. It's good to see you all, as always. So let's take about a half an hour or so to sit together, shall we? Find a comfortable position for the body to rest. I'm taking a few minutes just to consider what might be comfortable. There's often so much pushing in my day that this instruction to just rest, find some ease, find a bit of comfort, never really gets old. So right away we can remember that This practice doesn't have to require striving. You can feel some urgency that calls us to stillness or to our chair cushion. Or to sincerity might be a nice way to say it. But urgency isn't the same thing as striving. Trying to complete something or get somewhere. So you might just notice how it feels in the body to back off a bit. See if it's possible for this heart to be sensitive or for the mind to be aware in the middle of comfort, ease or rest, relaxation, some kind of embodied posture that points to non-striving. Just feel the possibility of awareness, of sensitivity that isn't dependent on pushing. It's just available in the space of ease. 
It's just available. Being willing to feel the body. This living organism. Sensitive, porous. Strong. Resilient. Remembering that life is experienced right here in and with the body. So without needing to direct attention here or there, we can just be curious. about how experience, how life is manifesting in this moment. We might notice body sensations, or movement in the body. We might notice pressure or pulsating, tingling, heaviness. You might notice sound, experience of the ears. We might notice naming sound, 
the conceptual overlay of this raw experience. You might notice the movement, the leaning in, the listening, and how that feels different than hearing. We might notice the thinking mind. We might even notice that we notice the thinking mind only after being caught up in thinking. It's okay. All this is happening. All this is what we might call life experience. And perhaps effective states are available, emotion, Resistance. All part of life. All of life happens right here. Embodied. So just allowing in the space of ease, just allowing sensitivity to do what it does, connect, allowing the heart, the mind to connect with any experience, body sensation, sound, thought, emotion, And without pushing, without trying to change anything, just connect. Oh, it's like this. Thinking is like this. Feeling the body, feeling things is like this. The pressure is like this, heat, coolness, emotion, sound, listening. This, the experience of life, this is how I know I'm alive. It's like this. No need to run. No need to be better. If it feels useful, you might even place your hand on your chest for a moment just to remember. Like, oh, sweetie, it's okay. Don't have to do anything about this.
And let's continue in silence together now.
Take a minute to attend to the body's needs if you'd like. You can even step away from the computer. I won't start for a couple of minutes. Welcome once again. Nice to take a minute just to appreciate being together. If you want to turn on your cameras for a minute or two, you're welcome to do that. No obligation, but let's just look at each other. Say hello. Yeah, use the chat. That's great. Even really taking the names of people. There's no camera on, just appreciate presence. And presence from all over. Not just Minneapolis, St. Paul, but all over the world. Zooming in to hear the Dharma, to practice cultivating a kind and generous heart. It's become a practice that I really appreciate. Just knowing that there's goodness spread all over the world, you know, evident by people showing up here to cultivate a good and kind heart. It's not a small thing, right, to, to notice that. So tonight I'd like to talk about going for going to the Sangha for refuge and just some reflections on relating to the the third and important refuge of Sangha. And often this third refuge, the third of the three jewels gems, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. These are the three refuges. And it's often the third that gets a little less press than the other two. It's a bit underrepresented here. And yet one of the three jewels. Often Buddhism and convert convert Buddhist communities like ours. What does it mean to be a convert Buddhist community? Well, Buddhism Buddhism originated in Asia and then migrated all over the world. 
And as Buddhism moved from place to place, as people practiced and moved the practice from place to place, Buddhism takes on, took on, takes on aspects of the cult cultural norms of that place and environment. So here in the United States, we didn't, the Buddhism, if we weren't a, an, an Asian country where people practiced Buddhism as a way of life, but we have learned about the practice and we have converted some of us to the practice of Buddhism through the generosity of others. And it would be hard to say all of that without acknowledging our Asian siblings who've been here in the United States for so long, well before our beloved teachers, Jack Kornfield and Joseph Goldstein and Sharon Salzberg um, came back from Asia and started teaching. And most of many of the Japanese Buddhist elders and teachers um, were were um, held in concentration camps and during the Second World War and really decimated many of the the communities. So that's part of our history too as practitioners we we're part of the lineage of western converts here that includes that reality and we live and breathe we breathe it every day don't we yeah, because history is never just in the past it always has uh, you know it's karmic it has its karmic imprint in the current moment of time too <clears throat> So going for refuge, you know, if I've talked a little bit about refuge the last couple of weeks. Going for refuge, refuge as a verb. Going to the Buddha for refuge, going to this, going to sensitivity for refuge, trusting in this heart that knows how to connect and be sensitive as a primary force of how we live our lives. And that's what we might call going to Buddha. We can take refuge in this historical being who lived and practiced and experimented and did radical things so that we may benefit from the teachings now. So we can honor this historical person, the Buddha, as one way of going for refuge. And in doing that, what we're, what we're doing is Acknowledging the possibility of sense of taking refuge in the sensitive heart right here and now. So going to the Buddha for refuge and Buddha knows Dhamma, right? The sensitivity of this heart then connects with the truth of the way things are. And so Dhamma, we might, we might call nature. When we connect with the truth of experience now as lived through this embodied existence that we're all with, then we, we start to understand something deeply. We connect with the nature of emotion and we see something about emotion and learn how to not take it so personally. We learn that emotion is a force of life, right? For everybody. We learn that all experience comes and goes, for example, right? This is the depth of the Dhamma. Going to Dhamma for refuge is really going to the depth of what we might feel when we connect with nature. Oh, this is not, this is not stagnant. This experience is not the same in every moment. What I might call fear or anger as an example is not the same in every moment. It's hard to call it a thing even because it's so varied, right? It peaks and it wanes, it brings heat and then a bit of cooling and in moments. And so when we understand nature, we feel the depth of Dhamma, right? Impermanence, that 
and misunderstanding change, misunderstanding impermanence then causes problems for us, right? This is what we might call dukkha. So the three characteristics are represented here. So when we misunderstand that, ah, oh, this keeping with emotion as the example that I'm using here, when I misunderstand that fear is just coming and going, it has a birth and a death to it, right? It emerges on the scene and then dissipates. When I forget that and think I'm a fearful person, right? Then I sort of cling to fear as a thing. And now I forget in this moment that actually this, it's so varied. The actual lived experience, the embodied experience of fear is so varied. This is the misunderstanding that causes suffering in our hearts, the internal experience. And so, the, so take, so the Buddha taking refuge in Buddha that knows Dhamma, since the sensitivity, the sensitive heart, how valuable it is. And it's so valuable that it is worth actually bowing to, right? Like, wow, this is more important this heart that can be sensitive, that can remain sensitive in the face of great difficulty is really trustworthy. So we learn this about going for refuge. And it's through the sensitivity that we start to learn. We st learn about the nature of experience. We learn about, we learn how to love each other here, right? Because we learn that we're not so different and that our karmic habits are all tied in each other, just Right now we're a global community across the whole world represented here in this little Zoom room, right? So our learning is really intertwined because we're all benefiting, right? And we're all contributing to our collective well-being right here in this moment. So Buddha that knows Dhamma and is connected to this web of causality, this web of karmic reality, cause and effect, Right, the, the beauty of this wondrous moment where we all show up here at common ground and then take the show on the road, right? Take our learnings back into our own communities. This is the beauty of Sangha. So the Buddha, knowing Dhamma and refuge in the interconnectedness of all things is what we might call Sangha, taking refuge in Sangha. So, Taking refuge, as I've mentioned, I think last week and maybe the week before, can be a kind of orientation for us. And I've been really uh, decided to talk about refuge over the past few weeks because it's been such a useful practice over the past couple of years, for sure. But for sure, when all when all else fails, right? When I don't know what to do when life feels really complicated, which is often these days for all of us, then to remember like, oh, it, it really is trustworthy for this heart to care. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to, how to move, how to talk, what next action to take, but it's really trustworthy. This heart that can feel is really trustworthy. That's taking refuge in Buddha. And it's because I've learned over time that valuing sensitivity then often points to something deeper. Like, oh, this is really hard. It's really hard to open to the truth of change. It's really hard to open to death, for example. It's hard to not wanna have control over things that I wanna have control over, right? Oh, that's, that's dukkha. So we learn right here in this moment of taking refuge. And so as an orientation, it supports living, has supported me in living in a meaningful way, especially during hard times. Right? To orient in the direction of something that's reliable, something that's sustainable. You know, it's never gonna get old to trust sensitivity. It's never gonna get old to trust change. It's never gonna get old to remember that we're all interconnected. That's always gonna be a value, no matter what, 
no matter what's happening internally, externally, that's always going to be important. So I know that, right? And I can go back here, right, when things are hard. So as an orientation to live life. And it can also be refuge. Going for refuge can also be a way of, and this is one of the important things I've learned, is that a, a sign of mature practice, maturing practice, not like a destination, but a, a sign of maturity in practice. And Ajahn Tanisaro, Tanisaro Bhikkhu, Ajahn Jeff, says this about going for refuge. He says, the act of going for refuge marks the point where one decides to take the Dhamma as the primary guide to conduct, to conduct in one's life. It means that one's relationship to Dhamma practice has matured from simple involvement into a commitment. And I, I love this, right? This, because it is deep. It is, we, we go for refuge in so many ways. I was just in the sit watching the planning mind arise and the kind of um, uh, how, how vivid the planning was in the mind. And then other experiences were sort of in the background, but the planning, the thinking was potent, right? right up front, like, oh, and I could feel that pull to take refuge in a plan, right? <laughs> this is really important, sweetie, to plan this right now, right? Instead of just resting in the reality of change, right? But because there's been some momentum and understanding refuge, the mind was, the heart was willing to see that. And actually, this the word refuge uh, is translated from a word, uh, I think it's retina or something like that, which means that which increases delight. So going for refuge is associated with a kind of uplift of the heart. Right? It's satisfying to let go of false refuge. It's satisfying to remember that even though this mind and this body needs to plan in order to do life, the kind of relentless planning isn't the most sustainable force in life, right? That actually trusting the sensitive heart that can connect with the, um, the elusiveness of thinking, right? Is actually a deeper kind of refuge. It, it was a relief to recognize that. It did feel good, right? There was a bit of delight in that moment. And this human life we're living has a lot of dangers, right? We're living we're living in a very difficult situation as human beings. Our lives are fragile, both internally and externally. And the internal dangers are the dangers of greed and ill will and delusion. So going for refuge is a way of finding a kind of protection in a deep way, a protection from the seeds of greed and ill will and delusion, right? being willing to really trust sensitivity when everything is pointing me in the direction of not doing that, right? And especially when we're experiencing something that's not pleasant, the mind will try to convince us that it is more, it is more trustworthy to actually get the hell out of here in some way, right? to do some planning or fantasizing or whatever it is to avoid feeling, to avoid trusting sensitivity. So the maturity of going for refuge, the maturity of practice really is about finding a, a release from the neurotic habits of clinging, of constriction, of greed, of ill will, of delusion that pull us all around individually and culturally right? in the collective. Every habit, every social 
reality, every habit in the collective, every bit of momentum, every force is, is contextualized, right? So contextualize and a way to understand some of the context is by understanding, you know, this is the way the Buddha taught, by understanding the mind and the seeds that the mind lays down and what they contribute to both in our own lives and in movements. And in the Satipatthana, the, in the, this um, really important sutta where the Buddha is teaching us how to practice, I mentioned this last week, another aspect of the, this teaching, that the, the Buddha says, the Buddha instructs us to remain focused, ardent, and alert, and mindful. Focused, ardent, alert, and mindful. And this word ardent is really an interesting one. It's often translated to mean something like um, energetic, passionate, intent, but it also has a meaning that is full of feeling. So ardent, when the Buddha says practice, remain focused, ardent, alert, and mindful, that full of feel feeling can have a devotional aspect. So when we practice going for refuge, we really, we can really practice sort of bowing down, if you will, to all of the expressions of greed and ill will and delusion, right? And trusting that the sensitive heart, even when it doesn't feel, even when it doesn't, even when the mind wants to convince us that it's not the way, right? To, to be sensitive in this moment because it's too painful or too confusing, that even in these moments, we can bow down to the complexity that manifests in this heart, in this system, in this family, in this community, in the collective. And we can understand why it's so difficult to take care of ourselves and each other, right? Oh, it's so hard. It's so hard to be a human being. Right? To wake up to these truths is really complex. And think about the kind of dedication that we all bring to our practice, every one of us here tonight. And we can feel really humbled by the complexity of expression among us, right? much less in, in the world. And in the Satipatthana, the, the Buddha, there's this, or the refrain, and it's important because it's, it shows up 13 times. So it's, one, it's something that we should pay attention to. And the, one of the things that um, appears in, in, the, in the refrain is this pointing to both the internal and the external, contemplating our experience, the importance of contemplating our experience both on the internal and the external level. Right, so what does this mean, the external? Well, there's a lot of debate about what the Buddha meant here, but it seems wise to consider the impact of, of our practice and be humbled by the impact of our unfinished business right? on the external envir environment and communities that we run in. And so taking refuge in Sangha at the core is about taking refuge in the karmic reality that we're swimming in. And I've, this has been so important that I've brought it forward many times, but to remember simply that every intentional action leaves an imprint, right? Every time the mind thinks, right, or we act or we move, it has some residue. Even if we don't know it in, in that moment, it leaves behind an imprint. And so taking refuge in Sangha is really being humbled 
and honoring, bowing to the reality of karma, the reality of cause and effect, that none of us escape, right? We're actually swimming our, in our interconnected web of causality. There's this you know, very well-known quote, this statement that Dr. Martin Luther King made, it seems to be really in line with the Buddhist teachings for me. He says, in a real sense, all life is interrelated. All men or people are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And I love this so much, partly because Dr. King was a Christian, right? And a devoted spiritual seeker. And so I think that there's at, at the core of our spiritual inquiry is this reality of, of being interconnected. This reality of our of karmic the karmic imprints of every moment and of our every intentional moment in our life and how that really shapes each of us in some way either directly or indirectly it's good to remember that you know the buddha was all about pointing to re relating why it's relating and in talking about how the mind relates to all experience, that's one way of relating. And there's this, uh, a third of the Noble Eightfold Path is about our ethical training. That's about wise relating to each other. And in this, the third jewel, taking refuge in Sangha, that's about wise relating also. Wise relating and appreciating uh, all of the wise expressions among us, taking refuge in Sangha, takes refuge in, we take, we go for refuge, we understand cause and effect. We also understand the value of planting seeds that are gonna be beneficial. Right? And we can appreciate those moments of kindness and compassion and wisdom in the room when we're together, even in a Zoom room like this. We're not all talking like we might be if we were together in the same building before and after a program or something. But even here, we can appreciate the kind of skillfulness that we each, that we each bring forward, right? And that is directly related to our cultivation, the cultivation of wise and beneficial habits. And we can really appreciate the uh, monastics that do this for their, you know, that take up robes and keep them on professionally, you might say, right? And they dedicate their entire life to living in community and practicing the Dhamma. And they do that so that they can carry the teachings forward to people like you and I who are living uh, living lay lives, working and taking care of families and we're in relationship with our monastic community. So part of taking refuge in Sangha is honoring this uh, lineage holders, spiritual practitioners, you know, who have really dedicated their whole lives and I, you know, I've talked about my, uh, my friend, Venerable Nyanika, many of you know her. Um, she was a common grounder before she took ordinate, before she ordained and lived. Um, now she lives with the, uh, the Bhikkhunis at Aloka Vihara. And I have a regular conversation with her, usually weekly. And I've learned so much about the intricacies of being in relationship, the kind of care that our monastic community practices with each other, honoring and uh, re reflecting back what they've heard from each other, you know, just in ordinary moments at, during their community meetings or 
um, while engaged in anti-racism work or nonviolent communication and all the ways that they put this put this to work, put their training to work. And sometimes I know in my own naivete, I would imagine the monastic community just sitting in silence all day long, right? <laughs> but that's not that's not it. They're working and talking and living and in, and interacting, really practicing the ethical parts of the path, the parts of right action and right speech and and what it means to not throw each other out of their hearts. It's a beautiful has been a really beautiful model for me, right? To just receive the transmission of people who are just so committed to not throwing each other out of their hearts and aren't afraid to acknowledge the reactive habits of mind that are there that manifest, right? All part of taking refuge in Sangha, learning how to not throw each other out of our hearts and also be really humbled, bow down to the full expression of humanity among us and the mistakes that we make. I was um, reading a little bit and listening to some talks by the by some of the bakunis and I, Ananda Bodhi was telling telling stories. One of the talks I listened to a couple of days ago, and she was uh, telling the story. And I was listening through the lens of wise relating, and so we're practicing and what it means to go to the sangha for refuge, and telling stories about the Buddha, the Buddha's awakening. This isn't part of what she said, but um, I'm going to link these two. One is that. Upon the Buddha's awakening, he, uh, you know, thought who he might after his big, big insights under the Bodhi tree. He thought, well, who he he might tell, and the first first thing that came to mind is, I'd like to tell my teachers. And his teachers were all deceased at the time, but I really appreciate the beauty of that intention to want to share one's learning with one's teachers and it's such a different you know i i was like well what you know do i think about that do i say oh this is a i've learned something let me go tell my teacher no i usually have some neurotic relationship to oh i'm not you know worthy enough or what do i have to teach my teachers or it's not a kind of uplift a delight in the learning right that just wants to be shared in relationship with someone or with many someones whom I deeply respect and have a great appreciation and gratitude for, right? And it, just the purity of that intention felt real, has felt really moving to me. And then get, getting to what Aya Ananda Bodhi was saying that uh, that you know these the buddhist teachings can be some of the the maps if you will or the the structures that the buddha used to convey the teachings can be quite linear but the buddha was also quite intuitive right and this is honored in the suttas too and so there's some of some of the um stories this is one of she was telling that there's this the story of the of the buddha and he would um he would often just be with his intuition and connect with where the Dhamma wants to flow, right? And have some intuitive sense that there might be someone in a particular town who's ready to hear the Dhamma. And he would walk for days to go to that town to offer some teachings. And often he would have some intuition about a particular person that was ready to hear the Dhamma. So there's this story about the Buddha walking for days to go to this town to offer some teachings and he gets there and the person that he thought was ready to hear the Dhamma wasn't there. And so a crowd gathers, they wait and wait and wait. And somebody's asked the Buddha, you know, uh, please, sir, are you ready to share the Dhamma? And he says something like, it's not time yet. And so they 
wait and wait and wait. And then they ask again, is it ready? Is it time yet? Will you please teach the Dhamma? And the Buddha says it's not time yet, right? And eventually, after a lot of waiting, this person uh, arrives and this person had lost a cow and they were out trying to find, they finally got the cow, they got it corralled. He was quite late, he gets there, he's seated. And then, you know, somebody says the boot to the Buddha, is it, sir, will you please teach the Dhamma? And the Buddha says, it's not time yet. Because he recognizes that this person is exhausted and hungry, right? And when you're exhausted and hungry, it's really hard to take it in. And so often this, this is told by oh, like the Buddha was so caring to realize and to be in relationship with human beings and to realize that this person was hungry and exhausted and he asked for someone to get him some food. And I also think about how, what a beautiful expression of Dhamma it is to just take care of each other's basic needs. And I remember how uh, some of our teachers used to talk about their experience with Deepama, was this really wise Indian woman, and how often, you know, Joseph Goldstein will say that the first thing she often said was, how did you sleep and how did, are you hungry, right? Not something that is insignificant as communicated in the story about the Buddha's relationship to a, just a regular human being, someone he didn't know. So a beautiful way to practice taking refuge in Sangha is simply just to take care of each other, to be curious about the basic needs. And that means, you know, our friends and our family, but it certainly means doing what we can do to assure that all people have access to basic needs. And this felt like a really potent story to hear as I was reflecting on the times that we're living in and yeah, things, things are rocky, aren't they? <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> Most people I know are yeah, have been at least moments where they're burdened by life, right? Where I feel that too. A little bit tired, a little bit sluggish some moments, maybe a little depressed, a little anxious, maybe a lot depressed, a lot anxious, maybe a lot scared, maybe a lot angry. These are all just really normal. And so the, the, as, as in terms of taking care of basic needs, to be willing to not push, but just to take care of our mental health when we need to, or to get some rest when we need to, or to prioritize friendship when we need, need to, as an expression of our Dhamma practice. as an expression of what it means to go, to walk the path of going again and again to the Sangha for refuge. Community is complicated, isn't it? going to the Sangha, going to each other, taking care of each other, offering something to each other might not feel like the easiest thing to do. I totally acknowledge that. I also, in moments when it's, it's a decent strategy, I heard this many years ago from Gil Fransdahl, he said something like, when I feel lonely, I try to give the gift that I need. So it's not the only strategy to go to the Sangha for refuge. It's not the only strategy when we feel, when we have a need, acknowledge a need, to give 
something away to be generous with something, but it's a, it's a strategy that served me well, right? When I feel lonely to reach out and connect, when I feel high energy states like anger, for example, to find some way to let that energy move in relationship with other beings, right? To go walk, to go for a run, to go to a protest, something that my body can be engaged with, to chant, sing loud, right? A beautiful act of, a beautiful expression of Dhamma. And when the heart feels overwhelmed, right? This is like this too for us sometimes. When the heart feels overwhelmed and disconnected to really honor that and not push through it, just to feel it like, oh, this is what it, it feels like here. And then to be curious about different moments that the heart might not feel that way. Oh, there's a little bit of something bubbling up here, right? That's a way, a beautiful expression, an ethical expression of how we might take care of ourselves and each other. And so ethics, engaging in, har engaging in care, full of care, a heart that is full of care, the ethical parts of the path we, we often regard as um, har harmlessness, but it's also, oh, we might say, a positive expression of the ethical parts of the path are responding, cultivating the kind of habits of mind that can express themselves in a heart that's full of, of care. Right? And so as part of going to the Sangha for refuge, we really honor the ethical, our ethical engagements, our engagement in harmlessness, our engagement in expressing care. And this is the perhaps the external expression of safety and protection that's offered by going for refuge. It's a way that we become a refuge for other people. It's the gift of fearlessness. We offer other people, you don't have to be afraid around me because I'm really going to practice being careful, expressing care, expressing harmlessness. You don't have to be afraid around me. And the Buddha encourages us many times to be a refuge for all beings. And I'd like to read these, I don't mean to embarrass you, Patrice, <laughs> but I'd like to read the precepts that you rewrote, if that's okay. You might have noticed in um, the weekly email a few weeks ago, and if you were here on Sunday morning, I, I read these then too. But I find these to be, um, Patrice rewrote the precepts in terms of engagement. So the precepts are these five training precepts, these five trainings around how to live an ethical life. And what I, I love, I love these. I've been um, looking at them quite often since Patrice shared them with the community. And I, I love them not just for what they say, but be, because Patrice was doing her job as a practitioner, being creative and internalizing the practice to be really responsive to the moment that we're living in, right? This is what we're asked to do. When we take refuge in Sangha, we really get curious about what that means right now, right? This is how the interest in mental health and self-care and taking care of each other's basic needs arose to the top of the mind, right? Because in this, way of maturing, deepening, maturing in practice, deepening into refuge, then the kind of creativity that makes practice make sense rises to the surface. So these five precepts, Patrice, do you want to read them since you're here? They're yours. <laughs> no, that, that's fine. Shall we go right ahead? Okay. So the first precept is the taking, undertaking the training to not kill, to not harm other beings. And so number one, Patrice says, do not kill. We begin with the intention of not harming self or other, even as we engage with hurt and trauma. Just let that land.
The second precept is offered by the Buddha is to undertake the training to not take that which isn't given freely. So number two, do not steal. We resolve not to take anything that is not our own, including any projections that we may think another holds. And number three, the Buddha asks us to train and not misusing our sexual energies. Number three, do not misuse sexual energies. We take responsibility for monitoring and working with our own energies, not letting them undermine or overpower our engagement with others. And number four, the Buddha asks us to undertake the training to not tell mistruths, to not lie. So number four, do not lie. We practice deep listening, even as we speak our truths, acknowledging the limits of our own understanding. And number five, the Buddha asks us to take up the training to not misuse substances that cloud the mind and lead to heedlessness. So number five, do not misuse substance. We restrain ourselves from acting on any impulse that fosters carelessness in either or both senses of the word, being heedless and being heartless. Just really letting the word settle into the heart. And using this example as an expression of how, you know, one person related wisely to this moment and to the being what it means to be in a relationship and take it as an opportunity for us to find our own way, each of us. But thank you for your patient attention tonight.